A very warm welcome to the second of our virtual discussion sessions from Maudlin. It's my very great pleasure today to welcome Fintan O'Toole, who is Maudlin's Parnell Fellow for this year and who's already put online his Parnell Lecture. Fintan, who is a very distinguished journalist and public commentator, is the official biographer of Seamus Heaney, former honorary fellow of this college. And it's been an enormous pleasure to have Fintan with us for part of this academic year working on that biography. You'll be familiar, I'm sure many of you, with his work in the Irish Times, in the New York Review of Books and The Guardian. And you may know that he won the Orwell Prize in 2017 and has established himself as a voice of fresh, forceful comment on current affairs recently, as well as a very distinguished scholar of Irish literature. To take part in this conversation along with him is our very own Professor Eamon Duffy, one of the most distinguished Reformation and post-Reformation historians of this country and of the English-speaking world, and a very old friend, a very significant part of the Irish studies scene in this university, and someone who is singularly well equipped to take part in this discussion about Seamus Heaney, whose connection with this college we greatly treasure, and for which we're deeply grateful. So the format will be simply that I will invite Finton to say a few words, summarizing some of the themes from his Parnell lecture. I'll ask Eamon to make a few remarks by way of response to that, and we'll perhaps have a little bit of discussion, and then I'll throw this open to the wider audience. We have, once again, a gratifyingly large number of people who've signed in for this event. If you want to ask a question in the discussion period, I hope you will be able to enter it on the Q&A bar, which you should see on your Zoom screen. And I will do my very best to take questions as they come in and relay them to our speakers. So without more ado, Finton, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't seen more of you because of the difficult circumstances of this year, but your connection with the college has been an enormous pleasure to those of us who are regular members of the family here. So tell us a bit about what you're doing, what you've said in the Parnell lecture, and what you'd hope to get from this discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Ron. And, and uh, thanks to everyone at, at Modeling for the wonderful hospitality that I've enjoyed, um, truncated though, though it has been by circumstance. Uh, and also, I'm really grateful to, to all the staff who've, who've put in such effort to make this possible today. At least we've got some version of the lecture. So, um, and I'm really looking forward to, to, to the discussion. Um, when you're writing a biography of a writer, and particularly of a poet, um, one of the temptations you have to avoid is, is drawing straight lines between life and art. Um, and particularly when you're dealing with, with a poet of autobiography, uh, as, as Seamus Heaney is, he, he of course, con, you know, con continually revisits in almost magical ways his own past, his, his capacity, which seems almost shamanistic at times, to summon up images uh, from, from childhood, from his early life, is, 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 is of course one of the extraordinary powers of, 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 of that, that great body of work. And as a biographer, you, you, you know, it's very tempting to say, well, you know, this is the poem, this is its origin in life, and, and let's um, compare one to the other. What you have to remind yourself of is that a lot of art comes from evasion and avoidance as much as it comes from directly dealing with the material of life. Um, and uh, artists are often um, driven as much by discomfort as they are by inspiration. Uh, and so I thought, in honor of Eamon, who, who, who is, uh, as you said, such a magnificent historian and, and also such a, a great friend of Seamus's, that it would be interesting just maybe to talk about about one major aspect of discomfort, arguably the major aspect of discomfort for Seamus Heaney, which is, which is history. <laughs> uh, not surprisingly, um, escaping from history, um, evading history, staying out of its clutches is uh, perhaps one of the great tasks that every modern Irish writer uh, has, has faced, um, really um, going back to the 18th century. Um, 
and and he he has his own particular dilemma in relation to this. Um, so I I was struck by um, just looking at at the archival newspaper record uh, and looking at the Middlestar Observer, uh, great great source uh, for for uh, South Derry life in 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 the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties. Um, and there's a cluster of events um, that, that's very striking uh, in, in 1959 and 1960, those two summers. Uh, and, and they're the first two summers of Seamus Heaney's um, uh, exile in, in Belfast. He's, you know, uh, as so much of that post-war generation in the UK, um, the first of his family to go to university. Um, so many writers in the UK have written in different ways, working class writers have written about that separation, uh, something that Heaney had already experienced to some extent, of course, by going to, to secondary school in, in Derry City. Um, but the, the very interesting moments then are these kind of revisitings in the summer of the home terrain. Uh, and it's revisited in this way, however, which is extraordinarily public. Um, and, and it centers on three highly charged public events, which are to do with uh, inserting himself into a very particular version of Irish history, um, which is essentially this sort of um, historical mythology of Irish Catholic nationalism. Uh, the, the three events are, are, first of all, he acts in a play about the 1798 Rising. Um, Secondly, uh, well, the, the the third one, which is 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 one that comes from, there's one in the middle. But the, the third one is he he performs as Robert Emmett, the great sort of martyr hero of of Irish nationalism, the inspirational figure, the the young, brilliant, self-sacrificing man who who attempts to overthrow English rule in Ireland in 1803 and is executed. Uh, and and. Emmett is this sort of radiant figure for Irish nationalism. Uh, Patrick Pierce almost sees himself as a reincarnation of Emmett, for example. Um, so it's fascinating to have this moment at which, at which Seamus Heaney is, is, is playing uh, Emmett and, according to the Middle Sir Observer, playing Emmett with extraordinary passion and conviction. Uh, fiery, for example, is, is, is one of the adjectives used by the very enthusiastic reviewer. Um, and in the middle of these two events, you also have, um, which I just discovered from an ad on the, on the, the back pages of the Mid Middle Street Observer, a showing of a film which was, was in its time extremely powerful and very controversial in Northern Ireland, a film called Misha Era by George Morrison, the first ever real compilation of archival historic footage, uh, which uh, deals with the period from the end of the 19th century up to Sinn Féin's victory in, in 1918 in the general election, but of course the, the 1916 rising as the centerpiece. Um, and it, in an unabashed nationalist format, so it's, it's a story of triumph. The commentary is, is, is um, you know, quite rhetorically nationalist. Uh, the score is by Sean O'Reilly, the great um, composer who was the first figure really to put Irish music into a classical frame, Irish uh, traditional music. So it's, it's, it was uh, adopted by the Irish state, you know, Eamon de Valera, who of course was not only the president of Ireland, but the last surviving commandant from the 1916 Rising attended the premiere in Dublin. But it was almost banned in Northern Ireland. So the recommendations for it to be banned, it was sort of unbanned, but it was a very subversive, almost Samizdat kind of event. And the ad that I, I saw was uh, advertising um, the um, only the second showing in, in Ulster uh, of Misha era. Um, and making clear that this was a, you know, a, a controversial event, something you really have to see now because you wouldn't get the chance again. And there was a list of, of three or four places you could get tickets. And one of them was Seamus Heaney. And then it gives them the, the phone number. <laughs> and uh, so the point here is that you, you've got a very concentrated, very passionate, very deliberate public identification and indeed embodiment uh, of, of this sort of nationalist version of Irish history 
um, that, that Seamus is, is very directly involved in at this time. And what's fascinating is that if you look, for example, at the, at the wonderful um, Stepping Stones um, with, with Dennis O'Driscoll, which is, I suppose, Seamus is the nearest thing to an autobiography, this sort of question and answer autobiography. Um, it, Seamus mentions seeing professional touring players playing Robert Emmett, uh, playing in these melodramas. And then uh, Dennis says, uh, did this inspire you to, to become a performer yourself? And he says, not at all, <laughs> which is, is odd. And, and there are some later kind of glancing references to this uh, in, in some of his prose. Uh, the main one is, is in this, this um, pamphlet, which is a, a, a lecture that was given in 1983. Um, where he, he's just sort of describing himself at this time. And he, 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 he says very briefly, I was acting with the Balahi Dramatic Society in plays about 1798, uh, now playing a United Irishman, a blacksmith forging pikes on a real anvil fetched from Devlin's Forge at Hillhead, now playing Robert Emmett in a one-act melodrama and having my performance hailed in the crowded columns of the Middlester Mail. Um, he even gets the name of the newspaper wrong. Um, it's, it's, that's it. That's, that's the only real kind of mention of, of what must have been a very intense experience. And what fascinated me was given how extraordinary he is at, at, at revisiting these experiences and, and at making poetry out of them, uh, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating that he, he, he really buries, might be a slight exaggeration in relation to this, but, but not, not much. Um, so what I then just want to suggest, and I'll, 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 I'll um, just do this very briefly, is that rather than being a problem, of course, th th this, this is this discomfort whose, whose sources are obvious, right? It's, 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 it's both personal. How do you break away from the familiar, um, from the world in which you have grown up? And every artist, every person perhaps has to do this. So it's part of that life story. But of course, it's also part of the larger story of, of, of the Troubles. It's 1966, the 50th anniversary of the Rising. It, it, it can often be seen as really the beginning of the Troubles in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Uh, and what I suggest is that, uh, that actually he never settles. So he, he, he frees himself in a way from this particular version of history. Um, but he never quite has to settle on another one. Um, and, and this is a source of extraordinary richness, I think. Um, if you think about Heaney, well, I think when people you know, who, who read him think about him, they think of an extraordinary rootedness, an, an incredibly direct uh, and, and potent um, sense of place and of time. Um, and the, that's absolutely true. I think that's, that is where the anchor is. Um, but when you move into the other terrain, the public terrain of history, actually what you find is an, is an ability to, to move around. Um, I, I suggested in the lecture, people have a look at it, that there are six different ways in which Irish writers have, have, have tried to deal with the burden of history. Um, and I, I suggest that the extraordinary thing about, about Seamus Heaney's work is that he uses all of them. You know, he, he, he doesn't choose um, and he, he uses one or other at a given time um, and then drops it, but may also wish to return to it. They all kind of remain available to him. So the argument really is that um, you have this, um, this kind of uh, vacuum uh, that's created by his discomfort with uh, his own early attachment to a particular version of Irish history, and that that vacuum gets filled and refilled in, in different ways. Um, and it's a great example of how um, not quite knowing what you think can be um, just as much a, a, a power for the poetic imagination um, as the very particular and certain and concrete kind of imagery um, that Heaney is so, so superb at, at, at bringing to life for us. Thank you very much indeed, Vincent. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful summary of, of the lecture, one of whose most interesting points is precisely the point you flagged up there, that in a poet so rooted as Heaney, we have to 
to come to terms, find a way of understanding what you called, I think, the unmoored relation to history that he develops, and what you, again, at another point in the lecture called the historical negative capability that this entails for him as a, as a poet. And the way in which that rootedness and that unmooredness bounce off each other in his work increasingly as time goes on, I think is, is one of the most valuable contributions that your, your study makes. But I'll hand over straight away now to Eamon for his thoughts in response to this. Eamon. Okay, I thought it would be helpful to maybe sketch in some of the detail behind the um, trajectory that Finton uh, has alluded to there. In July 2007, Seamus sent me a note on a postcard, and the content of the note's not relevant, but the picture on the postcard was very carefully chosen. It showed four heavily armed police officers of the Royal Ulster Constabulary standing outside their barracks carrying machine guns in Cross Madeleine in the heart of Catholic South Armagh, what was often called bandit country during the Troubles. The RUC was recruited almost exclusively from the loyalist Protestant population, and so it was distrusted by nationalists, and in fact widely suspected of systemic uh, collusion with Protestant paramilitaries, and those suspicions led to its uh, disbandment, uh, disbandment in 2001 and its replacement by the police service of Northern Ireland. So on the other side of the card, Seamus began his note to me with the words, lest we forget. I grew up in a nationalist town just 10 miles from Cross Madeleine, so he knew he was invoking shared attitudes, perhaps shared prejudices, but he was doing so privately. He was always very clear about his rootedness in that disadvantaged a minority, but he was never a highly political animal, and his own enormous influence made him cautious uh, about uh, making partisan statements in public. He was a person with a very strong sense of public responsibility. Now, nationalism, as, as uh, Fenton suggested, like all nationalism, Irish nationalism, is underpinned by a very schematic historical narrative with uh, very clearly marked milestones. The treachery of Dermot McMurrah, who called in the Normans, the Tudor and Stuart plantations, the penal laws, the rising of the United Irishmen in 1798, the bold Fenian men in the 19th century, and the blood sacrifice of the Easter Rising in 1916. And as Finton said, he began his Parnell lecture with a fascinating account of the 21-year-old Heaney's starring role as the nationalist martyr Robert Emmett in a Balahi Drama Society production. Now that was before the revival of the Troubles, but Seamus' general acquiescence in the nationalist historical narrative was signalled again in 1966, the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising, when he published and began to read regularly in public uh, a poem called Requiem for the Croppies about the defeated rebels of 1798, uh, which was sufficiently nationalist in sentiment to be soon co-opted into Republican propaganda. And in the murderous early 1970s, he felt that because of that, he could no longer read it in public. But he perhaps shouldn't have been surprised that it was hijacked by the IRA. He's talked about writing the poem out of his own conscious need as a northern, this is a quote, a northern Irish Catholic with a nationalist background. Notice he doesn't describe himself as a nationalist. Uh, he's a Northern Irish Catholic with a nationalist background, to voice something that hadn't been voiced. And he drew attention to the element of conscious transgression in celebrating the defeated rebels of 1798 in the Ulster of 1966. But the rising tide of violence in Ulster in the early 70s drove Heaney to a much uh, more urgent engagement with history, both recent and remote, and especially perhaps to prehistory. 
in what he called a search for images and symbols adequate to our predicament. So the volume of Wintering Out, which appeared in 1972, had a series of poems in which he related the soft yielding place names of his native bogland, Toom, Broch, and a Horish, to something fundamental in Irish identity. And he spelt out the implications of that in a subsequent volume, North, in 1974, in a, a poem entitled Act of Union, where British colonization of Ireland is portrayed as an act of rape, whose bastard offspring remained, I quote, an obstinate fifth column whose stance is growing unilateral not an illusion designed to delight loyalists uh, in the six counties. And the second part of North was made up of poems which charted quite explicitly the feelings of what he calls elsewhere an aggravated Catholic male's resentment uh, of intimidating encounters with the RUC and the British military. Now it's possible to see all this just as a recycling of long-standing nationalist historical tropes. But most famously, starting in Wintering Out and then with a vengeance in North, he included a series of frighteningly vivid poems based on images of the gruesomely preserved bodies of Iron Age sacrificial victims, uh, which were included in P.V. Dlob's book, The Bog People, which had appeared a couple of years earlier and which Seamus linked to the worship of a devouring mother godness, the goddess who was uh, embodied in the preserving bog itself. The fate of these sacrificial victims became metaphors for the slaughters of the troubles. And the imaginative link Heaney was making between sectarian Ireland and pagan Scandinavia uh, was given a bit of impetus by the very high profile excavations of Viking Dublin, which were just beginning at Wood Quay in Dublin. Now, North established Heaney unequivocally as a major poet, but his handling of this material proved bitterly controversial. He was denounced by former friends as, I quote, the laureate of violence, a myth maker, an anthropologist of ritual killing. He was accused of saying that suffering like this had always happened and uh, ha was happening now, and that's sufficient ground for understanding and absolution, and of portraying the Irish Catholic psyche as timelessly, quote, bound to immolation and savage tribal loyalties. Now, Seamus always rejected those readings of North, but he himself felt increasingly suffocated by the devouring solidarities, whether external and people's expectations, or psychologically internalized, that seemed to be demanded by the polarized violence in Northern Ireland. The poems in North were in fact assembled in Southern Ireland, in Wicklow, where he and met Mari had moved in August 1972, a move which of course was interpreted by his critics as desertion in the face of the enemy. He felt the need to free his imagination from the dark submissive worship of the goddess and the volumes after North see a steady move towards a lighter imaginative freedom and the dwindling of the historical matter of Ireland and especially its nationalist version as material for his poetry. As he wrote in one of the poems uh, of um, Station Island, I was mired in attachment till they began to pronounce me a feeder of battlefields, so I mastered new rungs of the air. One of the landmarks here, paradoxically, was a translation of an ancient Irish text, uh, the medieval Irish poem Willis Swivna, Sweeney Astray, where the transformation of an excommunicated and cursed king into a bird and his flight into the woods becomes an image of the costly escape of the poet from the constraints of place, tribe and history. And all that was made explicit the following year in Station Island, where Heaney returns to the medieval pilgrimage island in Loch Derg, County Donegal, to repeat in fiction 
a pilgrimage he'd made several times, in fact, as a student. Loch, the the Loch Derg uh, site is a place with deep religious and historic and literary connections to uh, Northern nationalism. But Heaney goes there to confront the strangling constrictions that these connections seem to entail, though his renunciation of it all is in the event qualified and partial. I hate how quick I was to know my place. I hate where I was born, hate everything that made me biddable and unforthcoming. But then he goes on, as if the kern stone could defy the kern, as if the eddy could reform the pool, as if a stone swirled under a cascade, eroded and eroding in its bed, could grind itself down to a different core. Now, that's a very uh, inadequate sketch of a journey in search of imaginative freedom. It wasn't an attempt by Heaney to deny or denigrate the forces that shaped him. As the postcard I started with demonstrates, his personal loyalties remained constant. And of course, he hadn't finished with history. The books after Station Island often engage with the past. Medieval Ireland, uh, Anglo-Saxon England, Greece, Rome. Above all, Heaney's own remembered County Derry upbringing. But that, as they say, is another story. Thank you very much indeed, Eamon, for our wonderful perspective on all this. We have a couple of questions already coming in, but uh, while other people are beginning to formulate questions, I wonder if I could just come back to you, Fenton, for a moment and ask one thing to uh, get the juices flowing a little. Um, one point you made in your lecture was, I think the phrase you used was, in memory, the past has ceased to be experienced. There's something in our, our rehearsal of our, our telling of memory which renews the experience. And I guess that part of what you're saying about Seamus as a poet, indeed about other poets, is that the, the challenge, the sort of pin on which you have to balance, is utilizing that memory without being trapped by it. Can you yes. say a bit more about that, that notion of memory as the past ceasing to be experienced? Yes, um, uh, uh, thanks very much. And, and thanks to Emma for that, that marvelous um, and, and masterly summary, um, much more um, uh, um, concentrated than, than, than my rather rambling lecture, but uh, thank you. Um, so I think for Heaney, um, you know, when, when we think about the, the, the mainstream of his, of his, of his poetry, it's, it's, it's engaged with this reanimation of memory, of personal memory. Um, and it's capable of being reanimated precisely because it is in the past. It, it, it's, it's, it, it keeps its chronological place as it were, then the paradox then being that, that because it's past, you can, you can um, re-enter it um, and, and, and uh, you, you know, find in it these, these images that then almost escape time. Um, it's 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 separate from the present and the future. The problem with history, and particularly with Irish history, of course, is that's exactly what it refuses to do. Um, that the reason why Irish writers um, have to both try to escape history and then realize that they can't do that and have to deal with it somehow is, is precisely this sense of recurrence. Uh, it, it keeps happening and, and particularly uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, there is this very, very powerful sense that, that it, it, is, it, is, it is going to go on being experienced. So uh, Stephen Dedalus's line in Ulysses, you know, about history being a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake, uh, is is very often quoted by Irish writers at that time, um, but even that, in a sense, understates the dilemma because the problem is not that it's a nightmare; it's that it's that it it it's, it it won't go asleep. 
it, 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 it just continually recurs. And so I think Heaney has to adopt different strategies in terms of dealing with the historic past to the ones that he uses in dealing with the personal past. Now, of course, that, that somewhat schematically suggests that there's a complete distinction between them, uh, but, but nevertheless, I think it's, 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 it's broadly true. Um, and I think what, what um, uh, as Eamon very eloquently said, you know, he, he has this very powerful poem, The Requiem for the Croppies, which uh, is, is exactly as Eamon describes. I mean, this is, is not just a poem that people really like at readings in, in certain communities, but it is taken up mm. and it's, it becomes almost a kind of propaganda piece. And the reason it's taken up, taken up is that it is itself a recurrence. So one of the things I tried to point out in the lecture is that if you look at the imagery in Requiem for the Croppies, it's exactly the imagery of one of the great moments of Irish nationalist mythology, which is Patrick Pierce's oration at the graveside of O'Donovan Rossa, which is itself about recurrence, right? So it's, it's about, here's our dead martyr, I'm more or less saying we are going to go off and you'll be, you'll be back in, in, in a couple of years time and we will be the dead martyrs. Mm -hmm. And this will go on until the great escat eschatological moment, you know, when, when the last days uh, arrive and, and Ireland is free. So it, it's, it's not just that it keeps recurring, but that recurrence itself is this sort of nightmarish um, theme of it. it. It just keeps going on and on and on. And so, um, you know, Heaney uh, uses the imagery that uh, Pierce uses. Pierce uses the imagery about, so the, Im the image, if people know it in Reckon for Croppies, is the seas. Mm -hmm. So the, the rebels who've been going off to fight uh, have taken barley seeds, put them in their pockets, they're killed, and then after the barley grows out of the, out of, out of the grave. Um, and this is exactly the imagery that, I mean, Pierce uses directly this imagery about mm -hmm. the seeds. But also Pierce says, it's from the grave, that the that life comes, and if you think about, for example, uh, so so he, he doesn't want to use that imagery anymore, right? He, he he moves away from it. He brilliantly contradicts it, I think, in in the Cure of Troy. Uh, I, one of my ambitions was to give a lecture about Heaney and history, and not say I hope in history rhyme, <laughs> you know, because uh, I think I'm sure by the end of his life, Seamus must have been, you know, completely fed up with 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 politicians uh, of various hues using that phrase over and over again. But if you look at the context of that great speech, it, it, it's a brilliant revisiting of, of, of uh, the Reckoning for the Croppies. It, it uses the same kind of almost millenarian sort of imagery. Uh, the, the once in a lifetime moment will come, but now it's a moment which is outside of history. Right? So history says, don't hope beyond the grave, right? So, so which is a direct contradiction of the whole Pierce mythology, takes it on, says, no, no, <laughs> that's not what history says. History doesn't say that hope arises from the grave. It says, don't hope this side of the grave. And then it says, but there's something beyond history. It's, it has that sort of wonderful uh, ecstatic quality of, of the once in a, once, once in a lifetime, the, the great tide of, 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 of justice can arise. Um, so what's fascinating here is that it's not just sequential. I, I, I mean, Eamon's absolutely right, and I think he's brilliantly laid out there. Of course, there's a chronology to the work. But what, what I find fascinating is that he can, he can go back when the peace process is happening. The Cure of Troy is essentially a kind of peace process intervention. You, you can go back at that point and you can revisit the earlier imagery, which you have discarded, and completely t turn it around, you know. Um, and, and that's something that can't really happen with the biographical memory. So the biographical memory, you know, the, the, these things happened, this is the image which, which is being made out of it. Uh, whereas the historical memory um, can, can be repurposed in, in all sorts of wonderfully creative ways. I can think of a very specific example of that revisiting. Um, there's a it's not one of his best poems, but there's a distinctive poem in his second book, Door into the Dark, uh, uh, about um, Galaris's oratory. So it's about a visit to an ancient Irish religious site. 
and he goes into this little chapel and is oppressed by the terrible sense of crushing weight of this place. And so when he comes out outside, there's a tremendous sense of whoosh of relief. So, it, and I think that in his early uh, books, history has a terrible reductive weight. It impresses you. And it's very interesting that in that marvelous book, Seeing Things, which I think is one of his best books, there's a poem set in an identical setting. It's uh, a similar oratory in Clonmac Noise. And instead of this crushing weight, uh, a magical ship floats through the air and um, uh, an anchor falls down, attaches itself to the altar rail. And the abbot says that these poor people, um, they'll drown in our air. We must help them. So we must unhitch the, the uh, boat. And um, Heaney uh, sees the, this as uh, this setting as a vision of the marvelous. Um, the abbot said, unless we, uh, this man can't bear our life down here and will drown, the abbot said, unless we help him. So they did. The freed ship sailed and the man climbed back out of the marvelous as he had known it. And uh, so he's finding their environment marvellous and they find him marvellous. And this locus, this um, uh, ancient Christian oratory, instead of being a, an emblem of oppressed, the heavy weight of the past, has become a doorway into something marvellous. And that, that's a, a piece of chemistry that you can see happening in Heaney's work. Uh, after Station Island, mm. it, there is a kind of liberation. Now it has something to do, the progression of this has something to do with uh, the resolution of the violence in Northern Ireland, or, uh, it, well, of course, it's never been properly resolved, but at least it's easing. Um, but it's also some kind of transform imaginative transformation in Heaney himself. And I, I think myself that his, uh, encounter with uh, classical, the classical past, with Greece and Rome, with uh, uh, has a, a huge amount to do with this process of liberation. Thank you, Eamon, and thank you, Finton. Um, I think, Eamon, you, you've uh, given us a very interesting pairing there of images in those two poems. I, we've got about um, 20 minutes for questions and there are a few already arriving so if that's all right I will relay a couple of these and see where we get to. Um, an early question coming in from um, Nick Boyle was what about the seventh version of Irish history which is the unionist story? <laughs> Does that come into into the map at all here? Um, hi Nick that's a it's a, a, a splendid question. Um, uh, so w when I was talking about the six versions, I, I, I was very much thinking about writers within the nationalist tradition. I suppose I probably should have uh, stressed that more. Um, but it's, it's, it's a splendid question in relation to Heaney, of course, because uh, he's, he, I mean, he, it, it would be unreasonable to expect him to be what he is not, right? So he, he doesn't have an obligation to inhabit the unionist version of history. Um, uh, although, of course, the Union's version of history overlaps in certain ways and, and, and mirrors the nationalist one, um, it, except that it, it, it sort of also turns it on its head. Right? So, the, the, the in, the run up, in the run up to the real eruption of the Troubles in the early 70s, uh, he's talked a lot about. Uh, the joint readings he did with people like Michael Longley, yeah. uh, where they, they both read poems out of their own histories and out of their own traditions. And he himself was writing poetry about the coexistence of those traditions. There's a poem in um, his third book uh, called The Other Side, which is about a Protestant neighbor uh, who 
spoke in fabulous biblical terms and who spoke rather disparagingly about the through other way that they the Heenies farm their land, but who had a sort of tact and decorum when they were saying their Catholic prayers, when they were saying the rosary and who waits outside the house. And in the poem, Seamus comes up behind him and uh, uh, says, now should I interrupt him or, or not? So he's, he's consciously uh, uh, trying to do the liberal thing to present the two traditions as happily coinciding. And that was his own experience in the 1950s in his part of South Derry. But it became increasingly to think uh, impossible to think like that about the peaceful coexistence of the traditions in the bloodbath of the early 70s. It, the, the situation was too drastic for some kind of liberal solution, uh, which is why he opted for this, uh, these myth mythical uh, metaphors. Uh, and it, of course, he was criticized for uh, opting for an a historical account of what was going on that would have made resolution impossible. Uh, now he, he felt that was a misreading of the poems, but uh, there is there's a shift in his attitude towards those things, which he reflected on uh, at some length in those marvelous interviews with Dennis O'Driscoll. Indeed, there's a marvelous. Just very briefly, the the you know I I think I think what he really does with this is is in the translations. You know so. You have those three great translations you have, as, as Eamon spoke about so well, the, the, the uh, Sweeney poems, uh, which comes from the Gaelic tradition, the translations of Henryson, which come from the Scottish tradition, which of course very much is identified with uh, the Ul Ulster Scots, which is the Presbyterian tradition. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the great um, Anglo-Saxon, um, the, 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 the translation of Beowulf, in which, and in, in each of these, what he does is, I think, a, a, an extraordinary kind of triangulation because he, he uses his own tradition as a way into these other traditions. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where the great generosity, imaginative generosity lies. He, he, he referred to the Beowulf translation as scullion voiced, uh, you know, or scullion speak. The scullions were his father's people, you know, poor Catholic peasants. And using that big, the big voice scullions as the kind of opening voice in Beowulf mm. is, is the way in which he connects very personally his own past and the Anglo-Saxon past, which is, which is mm. not supposed to be his. Um, and it's, it's, it's generous, it's subtle, uh, it, 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 it has that kind of quality, I think, of, 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 um, of, of uh, care and moral care that actually characterizes so much of his work. I think. Well, now, it's interesting that when he first came to Magdalen in the early 1990s, he uh, conducted a, a public discussion with Helen Wendler and he was working on the Beowulf translation at the time. And one of the interesting things he said about why he'd undertaken it was that he felt that in recently he'd got away from his own clunky, guttural, natural la language, and translating Beowulf would help to reconnect him to his own roots and to his own uh, forte as a poet. So he's presenting this Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, poem as a way of reconnecting to the Irish, you know, the, to the poet of um, death of a naturalist and door into the dark. We, we do, in fact, have a question about the Beowulf translation from Peter Sullivan, who asks, who are the Beowulf and Grendel of modern day Ireland and its history of British colonization? <laughs> 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 Believe that one to you, Finn. Well, that, that, I was going to hope that you might take it, actually. It's, um, uh, well, well, of course, the problem is that um, each side is, 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 is the other's Grendel, you know. Uh, uh, so the the difficulty in 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 transcending, of course, is is, and, and I, I think Heaney becomes increasingly aware of this as as the troubles go on and, and as his own thinking about it goes on, which which of course is that each side does have its own sense of victimhood. Um, Heaney would have grown up 
absolutely as Eamon did and you know completely understandably experiencing oppression experiencing a sense of being a second-class citizen of of that kind of as Eamon spoke about that kind of constant threat that's in those poems the, the meeting of armed men in the night wearing uniforms uh, uh, however the imaginative leap has to be that you you begin to understand that the other side is also scared uh, and also has its um, apocalyptic sense of of the future the nationalist apocalypse is 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 sort of um, or the, the nationalist millennium as it were is 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 hopeful it's the moment at which you you know ireland is united and the the old story ends and we're all happy uh, the unionist one, of course, is is the opposite, which is is it, it's it's the same event, seen through a completely different lens, which is that this is the moment of annihilation, uh, and so that's I think why this this um, this need to, which I think he achieves achieves this kind of negative capability, you know, to to to, to get into a stage at which you do not. Uh, have to and indeed do not want to um, adopt a fixed position as to who's Beowulf and who's Grendel. That, you, know, that you, you sort of understand that um, each each side has its own monstrous imaginings, uh, a, a, and that you have to do something else. I think the cure of Troy is very important in this in his own thinking. You know, where where the wound is not nationalist or unionist. You no, know, it's the wound of of that kind of resentful, fearful view of history yes, yes. that has to be transcended. Now, thank you. And moving on from uh, this to another kind of comparison, not Beowulf and Grendel this time, but a more political one, which Eamon, I think, referred to obliquely in the end of his remarks. Um, this is Philip McDonough in Dublin. Seamus' Nobel lecture, crediting poetry, anticipates pretty explicitly the terms of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Should we not look on Seamus as the literary counterpart of John Hume, his fellow beneficiary of the Butler Education Act? And we might compare Thomas More and Daniel O'Connell, Yates and Parnell, who I think he of Morden. So another comparison to think about is, is Seamus the John Hume of the literary world. I'm not Feynman, you might uh, have a thought on that briefly. Well, I, I mean, Seamus uh, was always very clear that he was not a direct contributor to the peace process. I mean, he didn't, he, he didn't claim that his poetry had uh, you know, um, made a huge difference, but obviously it did in the sense that um, Northern Irish nationalists were widely viewed in the Republic as strange and sometimes fanatical people. And he was a transformative figure in bringing the Northern nationalist experience into the general uh, consciousness of uh, Irish people and beyond Ireland. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, Seamus became the national bard. Um, he became the world's most famous poet. Uh, the Nobel Prize helped with all of that. And the response to his death showed the extent to which uh, he'd been appropriated uh, in Ireland. And I think that played an enormous uh, part imaginatively in uh, the solidarity of people with with what was happening in the north and uh, the commitment of the south because it, 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 it was often said that Irish politicians um, trumpeted the need for the reunification of the island and dreaded the day it would happen because they would have to actually deal with people whose experience had been so difficult and bitter that they would become a problem in a peaceable republic. And I think Heaney had an enormous amount to do with um, changing that situation. Thank you. There's a, a question specifically for Finton, which shifts the focus a little bit, but I think we might explore another theme here. Um, I wonder 
writes Michael Risk, about the status of poetry itself for Heaney as opposed to drama or prose. When we talk about Heaney's historical negative capability, are we talking about a capacity which Heaney found specifically in poetic language? Might this explain why he wanted or needed to turn to poetry in the first place? Yes, uh, thank you. That's a, a terrific uh, question, I think, and, 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 and puts its finger on something that really is central. Uh, I, I, I think it's absolutely true that, that, that poetry is the only form in which it is possible to explore uh, with, with honesty uh, and, and, and with, with, with all of the acknowledgements of discomfort and contradiction, um, the, the relationship of the individual to this public realm without having to take a stance, you know, without, without feeling that there is a, a very specific point of view that's, that's, that, that's being operated. I think, um, I think Yeats is a very important figure. I mean, that's, sorry, that's <laughs> uh, to, to, to uh, take the prize for the most obvious statements of the day, but why is Yeats so important for Heaney in relation to this? Obviously he's important at all sorts of levels as a poet, but I, I think what Heaney gets from reading Yeats is, is Yeats's extraordinary ability to contradict himself in, in, in verse. Yeats's great poems um, seem to deal with history and yet become extraordinarily slippery and, and fluent, fluid in the way in which they, they do it. So he, he's continually setting up thesis and antithesis and forming a synthesis and then undermining it. And, and, and this, that sort of electric movement in those great Yeats poems when he's dealing with, with historical events, uh, I think is, is, is really what Heaney takes from Yeats more than anything else, you know, is, is that this is a form in which you can do that and in which nobody can say, but hold on a minute here, that doesn't make sense. You know, the lyric poem does not mm. make sense. Uh, and, and, and Heaney's capacity to use it. Um, I mean, Eamon talked brilliantly about Station Island, for example. And of course, the whole point of Station Island is that it's kind of like a drama, but it's, 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 it's a drama in which there is no central character uh, and a drama in which these, these multiple perspectives and multiple voices become uh, equally powerful and hold their own space. Um, because poems don't really work even sequentially, you know, obviously in a very literal sense they do, but as we read poems, we're, we're continually recurring, aren't we? And we're, we're going back and forward between the verses, between the voices. Um, so uh, I, 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 I think the question probably is more eloquent than the answer, but I, I think it puts its finger on that. Well, there's another question which, which goes to Eamon, in fact. So if I can just switch to you, Eamon, for this one, because it relates exactly to what's been said. This is from Eamon Vincent. Um, I remember hearing you, that's you, Eamon, tell of a trip you made with Seamus to visit the grave of John Clare. John Clare's grave bears the inscription, a poet is born, not made. I seem to recall from your speech that Seamus did not entirely agree with that sentiment. Have I remembered correctly? Has he? Well, it, it wasn't a question of agreement or disagreement. Uh, he was intrigued by the inscription, which is a, a, it's a classical saying. And we went into the church and visited the church and uh, uh, Helpston Church is very beautiful. And we spent a long time in there. And as we were leaving, I said, you better sign the visitor's book. And he paused and I could see he was thinking carefully. And then in his beautiful script with his beautiful black fountain pen, he wrote something and I peeked at it and it said, Seamus Heaney, born and made. <laughs> Uh, so it was a statement uh, that you could make what you liked of. <laughs> <laughs> Very poetic. But I think it, it does connect precisely to this question of whether there's any, as it were, conscious adopting of a poetic mode or whether that's the discourse which somehow your, your experience drives you into. I mean, Heaney wrote prose like a poet. He did. I mean, he, they're full, and, and sometimes he took chunks of his own prose and turned them into poems in the way that Edward Thomas did. Um, 
and if you think of these amazing phrases, the dolorous circumstances of my native place, a famous uh, phrase in the Nobel uh, oration. But it is, as Fenton says, they, they, it's very interesting that he chose to focus the Nobel oration in the second part of it on the example of Yeats and specifically the poems Yeats wrote uh, during the Civil War, um, um, 19, uh, 1919 and uh, Meditations in Time of Civil War. And he's pointing to uh, uh, um, the example of the way in which a poet can illuminate the contradictions of experience mm. and uh, to bring some redress by doing so. That phrase of his, the redress yes. of poetry, yes. Yes. Uh, is a river that runs right through his writing. Isn't it just? Yes. We're running out of time, sadly, but I wonder if I could just um, ask you both for some very, very brief comments in response to two final questions. We haven't got round absolutely all of them, but um, one is a question from Rosemary Boyle, which is really more of an observation, I think. The difference between being careful about how you speak about your history, as a Northern Catholic, say, and wishing to escape from it. How do you, how do you talk about it without, as it were, being trapped by it? Um, because there is an inappropriate reluctance to talk about history as well as an appropriate, that's one thing. And not wholly unrelated to both of you, um, which particular poems or anthologies, this is a question from Martin O'Brien in Belfast, which particular poems or anthologies in the corpus do you think would help people in Northern Ireland to deal constructively with what's been endured over the past 50 years. So, brief observations from both of you. Eamon first. Um, well, to take the last thing first, I suppose one would point to the other side, that poem about Catholic and Protestant coexistence, which is now once again imaginable in the North. Uh, it, it wasn't in the early 70s, I think, or, or only with great difficulty. Though there are poets like Michael Longley who r approached that differently and, and wrote about the possibility of that marvellous poem uh, where Priam kisses the hand of the man who's killed his son. Um, but I, would, I suppose the other side, I, I think Postscript uh, possibly Seamus's best poem, mm. which is about the unexpectedness of redress, the mm. way in which uh, as a kind of grace comes from the experience of, uh, in, in this case, just being in the wild. Um, uh, Seamus is a poet of hopeful experience. He, uh, he, he moved towards that. Uh, Fenton, leave you some time. Um, I suppose to take the second question, you know, it's 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 a difficult one, but I keep going back to the elegies, you know, because the, the stranded lock bag casualty, those those wonderful elegies for ordinary victims, yeah. you know, people who are not historical players, you know, they're not they're not Robert Emmett's, they're not you know Wolf Tone. There, there are, you know, a, a few handful of the three and a half thousand people who lost their lives. The vast majority of them had no desire to do so. You know, they weren't sacrificing themselves. They were being sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And Heaney's act of grace uh, in those poems, you know, is to restore their individuality. Mm -hmm. um, and to give us again, as we read those poems, the sense of grief. And Northern Ireland has still not dealt with that grief. This is a society which is still in denial about the trauma because it has not dealt with it. There has been no process of truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. the vast majority of the victims have never had, to use that terrible word, any kind of closure. There's been no trial, there's been no confrontation, there's been no recognition. Um, and, and you know there's so much in 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 in, in he, but but those elegies I think right now are almost what we need to go back to and say you know is it enough that the poet does it or does the society have to do it too 
and just to take up Rosemary's point then about uh, the, the 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 difference between you know being careful about what you say about history and 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 a sort of inappropriate and maybe damaging silence, I think is is, is extremely well made. I think what what um, what he though does give us is he comes back to a third thing that the, 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 there's not just amnesia on the one side or you know hammering people with with a particular tribal version of history on the other side. There has to be some space in between these two, and it goes back to Philip's question about John Hume and and you know Seamus's political impact and the political impact is keeping open that space. It's kept open linguistically. It's it's kept open morally, and that does, in the long term, have a political impact. Um, you know that that great line. I mean, the best six letters in any international treaty ever forged, I think, is is in the Belfast Agreements. You know, where it says it is the birthright of everyone in Northern Ireland to be Irish or British, or both, as they may so choose. Those that or both remains, I think, crucial, not just to Ireland, but I would argue to, to Britain as well. <laughs> but that's a whole other, a whole other story. But it, it, it's, it's keeping open that, that, that capacity to think in complex ways about who we are uh, and, and to feel that we may be more than one thing at any given time. There's a great line of, of Seamus's great friend, um, Brian Friel, you know, in translations, which is confusion is not an ignoble condition. And, and when you have the opposite of confusion in, in history is often not certainty, it's murder. If you're willing to kill people for something, you're not confused. And maybe you should be a lot more confused than you are. And what comes out of Heaney's um, brilliant, you know, uh, uh, unmoored, constantly moving between different frameworks for dealing with history, I think, uh, is this idea of a sort of positive confusion, of a, of, a, of a possibility of embracing contradiction and complexity and fluidity, not as things from which we must flee into tribal hatred, but as the sources for uh, possibility. And I think that's what he does uh, so brilliantly and, and why as well as his his great aesthetic power, he does retain a political power. That's, that's a wonderful point on which to conclude, I think, Vinton. And um, it echoes for me a passage I really love in that wonderful book by Dennis O'Driscoll that you've mentioned, where O'Driscoll asks Seamus about what sustained him and the Ulster poets through the Troubles. And this is what he says. All of us, Protestant poets, Catholic poets, and don't those terms fairly put the wind up you? All of us probably had some notion that a good poem was a paradigm of good politics, a site of energy and tension and possibility, a truth-telling arena, but not a killing field. And without being explicit about it, either to ourselves or to one another, we probably felt that if we as poets couldn't do something transformative or creative with all that, all that we were a part of, then it was a poor lookout for everybody. I think that, you know, that is a really um, crystalline picture of what the political poetic frontier looked like for Seamus. And I think both you, Fenton, and you, Eamon, have helped us in this last hour to see how that works itself out in the particularities of the poetry. I'm very sorry that um, I haven't got round all the questioners, but time has been short. There are a few people whose questions, I'm afraid, haven't come into focus, but um, I'm sure that Fenton and Eamon will be happy to receive questions electronically at some point. But it's my job now simply to say thank you for all who've joined us. Um, again, well over 100 people have been part of this, uh, this event, and we're delighted that this has been so well taken up. But above all, thank you, Eamon, for your presence and your contribution. And thank you, Finton, for your lecture, for your presentation today, and for being part of the Maudian community in this last year. We've been privileged yeah. to have you. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everybody. And we'll hope to see you again um, virtually or in the flesh. Thank you. <laughs>